The job of a leader is to uh, reconcile the, the brain with the heart. That, hey, what we do uh, makes a difference in the lives of people. And you don't have to separate your heart at work. You don't have to be all cerebral at work and think it's just, oh, it's just a job and I'm just doing this technology for technology's sake and you know we make money or whatever. Uh, no, it's actually impacting someone's life. Hello, healthcare. I think that a lot of re uh, a lot of the reason that our audience comes together and that you're watching this show is because you know that you're called upon to make a difference within healthcare, and part of that uh, involves doing the absolute best in w whatever role and capacity you're serving right now. But of course, there's a growth element to that. There's always the thinking on how can I impact more uh, people and do more more lives as I climb forward and progress my career. So I wanted to, to, to dig into that and, and really just get, get into the, those thoughts on a personal level. We, we often talk about um, heady concepts around consumerism, population health, artificial intelligence, and things like that. But I want to get into the perspective on, uh, on, on personal growth and development. And I couldn't think of anybody better to have this type of conversation with than Ed Marks. For those who haven't had the, the opportunity to speak with or meet or see Ed, I've got to tell you, he's, he's just one of the most genuine, grandest people in the world, most humble people in the world, too, and it uh, comes from a really great background. He's been on the, uh, on the consulting and advisory side with, with, with his uh, career at Advisory Board and has led IT and digital transformation operations at Texas Health Resources. Uh, Tech Mahindra, uh, he's been a, 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 in the, the Army Corps of Engineers? Correct, yes. Correct. So Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Chief Information Officer at Cleveland Clinic. I'm, go I'm it's going on way too long. <laughs> and, and currently, the, uh, the, uh, just very recently, the CEO of uh, Divergent Health, which is a healthcare, uh, uh, a, a healthcare cons consultancy. Uh, so with that very long introduction, Ed, just wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about your, your background. We're, we're going to go deeper into uh, like when you found your calling. There, there's a, there's some, real, so, some really powerful stuff that you've been doing lately, and I, I just wanted to dig in, dig in deeper to that, uh, into that and uh, give other people the opportunity to, to think about where they are in your own careers and, and how, how you can start moving forward. Well, Chris, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you. And yeah, I'm happy to share whatever nuggets that I may offer uh, to the audience. And maybe there's one or two things that help someone along in their career. So I'm ready. I mean, I'm excited to chat with you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you very much, Ed. And uh, yeah, thank you for being with, with us today. And I, I'm just got, got to admit, uh, there's, uh, you, well, you introduced me to uh, Minerva Tentoko, who uh, is currently the chief AI officer at uh, NYU uh, McSilver Institute and was previously the CTO of uh, New York City. With your, your recent transition over to CEO of Divergent, I'm just wondering when you, uh, like, like when you got your calling or how, how long ago you realized that there's a path that, that leads to this. Yeah, well, I was very fortunate, Chris, you know, my calling started when I was a teenager and I was a janitor in a healthcare facility. And back in those days, you know, you had these uh, Walkmans and these giant headsets and I was probably listening to the Stones or uh, ACDC, and, but I was cleaning, sweeping and mopping and taking out the trash. And, but there was something about the, the, the atmosphere, the culture of the organization in healthcare that was like, wow, I want to do that. But I didn't know how it would turn out, right? I didn't know I'd become, you know, the chief information officer of the Cleveland Clinic or now the CEO of Divergent. So, so it's kind of a journey, but the seeds were definitely planted there. I just always, I had this hunger or calling on my heart for healthcare. And so I just pursued any opportunities to continue down that path. Because sometimes you don't might not have a specific vision, but you kind of have a general idea. So for me, the general idea was healthcare. So whatever was in my path that had anything remotely to do with healthcare, I would pursue it. And by doing that, it, things just fell into place. And I've been very fortunate along the way to have been mentored by many great leaders and to be parts of some really stellar teams. So I always tell people, man, I'm happy to share, but trust me, it's not 
just about Ed. It's mm-hmm. really about these teams that I was able to be a part of that were magical and did amazing things. So I'm just so thankful for all these things, including having met you a few years ago and all the great things you're all doing. Well, I uh, appreciate sharing that background. And um, I just want to dig a little bit be- deeper into that path. And then I want to get it kind of into the, the, the purpose of, of, of the journey that you're taking. But uh, along that path, one thing that, that really stood out about what you, what you just said is understanding like the team, like, like the, these teams, coalitions, mentorship. And I mean, like e- even like the, fa- the fact that we've had conversations years ago and are, are still having conversations yeah. to, to this day. Just curious about like what, what does it mean to, to like identify a, a, a mentor or how do you seek the people that uh, like solidify the, the type of journey that you wanted to take? Yeah, so I just looked for people that I wanted to sort of be like or be in their, those types of positions or or that I admired for some reason. And again, my, my, my thinking at this point now had been with a healthcare lens, but not necessarily tech, that came later. So it could have been uh, clinical or tech, but I always sort of had this, dream of, of, of big dreams. And I didn't want to just, and not that there's anything wrong with it. I didn't want to have just a regular career and a regular job, which are fine to have. So there's nothing wrong with those. But I just felt this sense that I was called to lead, to be a leader in healthcare. And so I sought out leaders and I would just yeah, just like I'm saying, I would see someone speak mm-hmm. or I'd someone write a book or I'd hear about a name. And I was just bold to go and reach out directly from them. So even when I was in the Army, you know, we talked a little bit about the Army. When, when I was looking for a speaker for our ROTC banquet, I went to the general of the United States Army. You know, I, I didn't try to recruit the local captain or someone like that. I went straight for the top, you know, and that's the way I've always been. So my mentors that I've had in my life have been these great leaders. And I found that if you ask people, I've never been turned down. So I think people are always happy to, to, to share something about themselves. And, and so that's really helped me. So I've had mentors along the way that have been a state senator. So Because I met this uh, senator. He was speaking one time. This was in Ohio 20-some years ago. And I was like, wow, that, that, he's an amazing speaker and leader. I want to be like him. So I just went up to him afterwards and asked him to meet with me for breakfast. He did. Then I asked him to mentor me and he took me on some trips with him. He, he, he shared all about his life. And then, then it became even more specific within healthcare. So it was CEOs and chief medical officers, chief nurse officers. And when I talk about mentoring, Chris, I'm not talking about, and there's nothing wrong with this either. I'm not talking about a one-time breakfast or a one-time dinner. Mm -hmm. These were contracted mentoring Mm. relationships. So I would, I had a one-page contract. It'd be one year long. And it talked about roles and responsibilities. And they seemed to love that because they didn't want to get involved with a never-ending sort of relationship that sort of wandered. So when I told them, hey, I want a one-year relationship with you, and here's how we'll lay it out, and I'll always be prepared. And again, everyone said yes. And now I can go back whenever I'm in crisis or like when I'm starting this new role. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm scared. (laughs) I've never been a CEO. What do I do? Well, I had a whole Rolodex of people that I could go back to and say, help me out. You helped me you know, 10 years ago. You helped me 20 years ago. And everyone's so gracious to help. So that's a little bit about the, the mentoring and why I, I think if people want to achieve greatness or want to achieve significance is probably a better word, you have to have mentors. And uh, that, that's a, uh, honestly, I, I hadn't heard of that contracted uh, mentor relationship before. Uh, what, what was the idea behind that? Or how, how'd you... Yeah, so one of my first mentors, Tom Zenti, he was CEO of, of University Hospitals for about 20-some years. He recently retired. He was the one that came up with uh, the encouragement for me to develop a contract with him. So when I became CIO, I really had no place being CIO at that point in my career. He took a big gamble on me. And, and again, sometimes it takes risk and moxie. And, and so make sure I come back to the mentoring contract because I'm going to go on a slight rabbit trail right okay. here. So, Remember I talked about how I'd go to the general of the United States, Mm -hmm. or I'd go to the senator. So in this case, I was this early 30s, had only been in IT maybe three years, and they had fired the CIO of this big academic health system, university hospitals. And I was definitely in the leadership ranks, but again, being fairly new to healthcare, didn't have much experience, certainly wasn't taught to be 
a CIO or anything like that, and they were starting to recruit CIOs that probably look like me today, right? They're in their early 50s and they've been in healthcare for 20, 30 years, been a CIO multiple times before. And so when I looked at them, I was like, hmm, okay, I know you have more experience, but I think I'm a better leader. Again, mm. it takes a little bit of moxie, yeah. not arrogance, but confidence. And so I went to Tom and I knocked on his door one day. This was in the middle of the search. And he's, he's like, oh, come on in, Mark. And so he's a tall gentleman and he sort of looked down on me. You know, he, he sort of ruled by intimidation a little bit if there was sort of a negative aspect of Tom. And so, but he had more positive attributes, right? But he would stare you down. So, you know, I remember telling myself, don't break a sweat, don't break a sweat. And, and he, he goes, how can I help you? And I said, I said, you can stop your search for CIO. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, because I'm, I'm the person, I'm the CIO. And he stared at me for literally a minute. And I think he's waiting to see beads of sweat on me. And again, I was just praying, no sweat, no sweat. <laughs> just stare right back at him. Don't flinch. And I didn't flinch. And then he cracked a smile. And he said, anyone who has balls to do that um, he deserves a chance. And so he gave me that chance. So he said, what, what are two things, back to your question, what are two things that you need uh, uh, to succeed, I said two things. One was to go to this boot camp that Chime put on for CIOs because I knew that would give me some training. And the second was to be mentored. So I said, to be mentored by you. He said, okay, I'll do it, but I, I want it formalized. So I did some mm. research and then I found uh, some programs and I didn't want to pay for a program, but I took some of the ideas from that program. And one of the ideas was a contract and I'm a believer in everything doing on one page. So I came up with this one page contract and it basically, basically said what the mission was and then what the agendas would be and that the length and when they would be, these meetings, one time per month, an hour and a half, I would set the agenda in advance, you know, uh, but they had to always be there for me. And then we signed it. At the first meeting, we made some adjustments and signed it. And then we met dutifully every year for an hour and a half. And sometimes he took me around to different meetings. Sometimes he took me to construction sites where he was inspecting. Uh, he gave me all these different opportunities. He taught me actually how to dress as well. That was part of my, <laughs> part of my. Uh, he did my a very good job. Yeah, yeah, very good job. <laughs> but I mean, it was everything. How to eat? How to? How to? Because people don't necessarily get this training anymore. What? What about wine? It's just basics on wine. The difference between red and white, and the different variations, and when you might order one over the other. Just etiquette, right? That no one ever taught me. And so he, he took it very serious. But anyways, a one-year contract. So I, I've perpetuated that one-year contract with everyone that I've been, been a mentor with. And when I mentor others, I give them that same contract, uh, the generic version of it. And I say, fill this out and I'll, and I'll agree to have a one-year relationship with you. So that's how it works. Excellent. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear, the, like, like, to, to hear the process behind that. And I, I think that's going to be new to a lot of people. You're talking about a lot of things that, that might not be taught anymore or just uh, different uh, differences in the path that you took. So that's really exciting to hear. But one, one thing it makes me think about, too, is, and this might go all the way back to that, that calling that you felt uh, back in high school, was uh, like, as you move to these positions and and uh, like take on these leadership role leadership roles, what's the purpose of that? Yeah. So one of the things that an early mentor taught me was to have a plan for my career. And again, I go back to the one page. And I studied right when I got my master's degrees. I took business classes and I studied strategic planning. And so I, I realized, just like we did at our organizations, we would put together one page plans. And I first noticed this before I, I got into my first hospital job. I worked at Teledyne Water Pick for a very short period of time. And I remember how the management team that I was observing, I worked on the assembly line. And so I, I was watching the management team, how they came together, they do retreats and they develop plans. And I thought, whoa, there's, there must be something to that because at the time they were doing really well and they'd go and have this retreat. So between what a mentor had taught me and what I observed from that early experience at Teledyne Waterpick was I decided to start putting my career on a page. And so I came up with a mission, vision, values, strategies, and objectives. So the objectives would be measurable, that I could rank myself. I either pass, go, no go, or maybe on a scale of one to 10. And then I would have a retreat for myself. And then I actually expanded this. I won't go too far down this road, but I expanded it to include uh, for my family. 
uh, for myself as a person, uh, for my marriage. So we came up with these one-page plans. And then we'd have a retreat every year where we'd review the plans and then make them better and or make adjustments depending on what was accomplished. So in that, I developed a vision. And in one of my plans going back, I'd have to look at the dates. I kept them all. Um, one of the plans talks about becoming, I finally had this vision to become a chief information officer. So I was very purposeful before I took my next position to say to myself, does this next position take me fur- uh, closer to becoming a CIO? Does it keep me further away? And so that's sort of how I determined what was next in my in my career. So again, going back to help with a mentor in one of these plans, it talks about getting experience in an academic medical center, uh, public health, not-for-profit, for-profit, a religious organization. So those are like the five sort of big types of health systems. Mm-hmm. And so I was... I intentionally, if you look at my resume, have now experience in all five because I thought I needed to understand academics. I needed to understand research. I needed to understand what it was like in public health. And so then I I could best determine my next step. Like, did I want to continue my career in which of those particular areas? And no matter what, I, I grew because I got exposed to things that you normally might not get exposed to by having that diverse background. So I, I was very intentional in my career in the positions I took. Now, most people don't have anything like that. In fact, I'd say 95%, Chris, right, don't have any sort of plan. And so they wander in their career. And mm-hmm. you look at their LinkedIn and, and their resumes, and, and they're frustrated. Some of them are frustrated. Like they want to become CIOs but don't understand why they're not, or they don't understand why they're still always in a small hospital and can't break out from a small hospital to a bigger system, or whatever it might be, they're frustrated. So I always ask them, I said, do you have a plan? Work on a plan. Be intentional. Just like you wouldn't implement an electronic health record without a plan. So why would you uh, run your life without a plan? I I don't understand that concept. so foreign to me. So that's why I always encourage people, have a plan. Because if you don't have a plan, why was it Alice in Wonderland or someone said, you know, if you don't have a vision or if you don't have a path anywhere, any place will take you there sort Mm -hmm. of thing. Because you're just lost. So most people operate... Loss. I don't mean to sound negative, but it, it's it's true. The hope, though, that every everyone can can write a plan because they all have experience doing this again in the workplace, and you can develop this plan and and start actualizing it. So that there's hope for everyone. So I want to dig. dig, dig uh, there's some questions I want to ask, but I still want to dig a little bit deeper on the purpose aspect, yeah. which is like when we target positions like chief information officer, chief chief executive officer. Um, I'm just curious about like. What's the impact that you want to be able to make by having those positions? Yeah. So it goes back to the vision. So my vision eventually morphed. Uh, so yeah, I did want to become a CIO. I thought that'd be, wow, that would be a sign that you know maybe I'm doing the right things in my career. And, and so as that sort of matured for myself, it became more about what is my purpose purpose? And I, I realized my purpose in healthcare, if in terms of my career, was to leverage technology to save people's lives. And that's sort of what my vision statement says today. It's about, I, I'm about two things. I'm about developing leaders because the only way to multiply yourself is to develop others. And, and number two is really to leverage technology to save people's lives. So I always looked for opportunities. So like before I went to New York City, I wanted to do public health. So that had not been done before in my, that I had experience with. And I was like, wow. We hear, especially given the situation at the time in New York City, especially from their digital transformation, uh, where they were in digital transformation, we had an opportunity to save many lives. And in fact, we laid down, and if you, you, know, you mentioned uh, Minerva, uh, thanks to her and many others, many of my colleagues, um, thanks to investments we made in New York City, uh, they will tell you today that one of the reasons they succeeded as well as they did during the pandemic was because of the digital transformation that took place. So I look back and say, we saved a bunch of lives. Even though it was after I left, mm-hmm. um, the work that my teams did, uh, we saved a bunch of lives. So that's always my motivation. So now I'm thinking as, as a CEO. So I, c- I could reach a certain amount of people working for a health system. So I could reach my community and beyond because of virtual care. But it was it was finite. And so when I thought about the opportunity to become a CEO of divergent, or it could be of any company like that, it's now you have the ability to really scale. Uh, so I couldn't really scale myself that much in a in a health system, but now as a leader of a company, I can definitely scale because I can work with many different health systems and many different payers and really sort of bring that thinking about, wow, let's, let's see how we can leverage technology 
to save people's lives. Yes, we do other things with the technology as well that are very beneficial. But at the end of the day, we all want to have significance in our lives and make a difference. And for me, it's like, wow, that technology saved people's lives. Like, well, I'll tell you one quick story because it, it's, it's still sort of new. So I took this role, chief digital officer at Tech Mahendra, for mm-hmm. many reasons in growth and growth and, and digital is kind of like where we're headed or where we are already and we'll further uh, explore. And, and we implemented this system for a particular health system <clears throat> uh, during COVID. And we did studies because I always like, I want to measure before and I want to measure outcomes because we want to adjust along the way to make sure that we're maximizing value. And, and we found that when we started our baseline, that, that a certain uh, population of theirs with a certain comorbidity that would get COVID had a 32% mortality rate. So 32% of those patients were dying when they got COVID. They're already very sick to begin with. After we implemented this particular uh, capability, it went to 0%. And so when you translated the numbers for that population, it was hundreds of lives. And so it's like, look, so I told my team, I said, look, team, because, you know, sometimes they think when you say things like, oh, we save people's lives, that it's like so far out there and not reality and it's kind of gimmicky, but it's not. It mm-hmm. literally happened. And so people sometimes, you know, a job of a leader, sorry, I'm kind of jumping a little bit here, but the job of a leader is to uh, reconcile the, the brain with the heart that, hey, what we do uh, makes a difference in the lives of people. And you don't have to separate your heart at work. You don't have to be all cerebral at work and think it's just, oh, it's just a job and I'm just doing this technology for technology's sake and you know we make money or whatever. Uh, no, it's actually impacting someone's life. Mm-hmm. And so we have to make that connection a lot of times for people, give them the opportunity to make that connection that what they're doing really makes a difference in the lives of people. And, and, and in some cases, it may not be saving people's lives, but it may increase the quality of their life. Or it may, uh, it may even uh, lead them to a more peaceful uh, death in some cases. I've, I've, I've leveraged technology to do that as well. So, so it's really connecting the heart and the, and the mind together so people see the big vision. Uh, but having that purpose, going back to the question, mm-hmm. is really that North Star that keeps us all centered. Because as you know, Chris, you get frustrated at work. Stuff happens. People might disappoint you, you might disappoint people. You know, stuff happens because we're catty or whatever, and we can easily lose sight and focus. But when you've got that vision, hey, we save lives, it brings everyone back to center. So that's why I'm all about having that one-page plan, Mm -hmm. um, having mentors, having retreats, really working on that plan. Because this is your life. Why not spend a few hours? Because it affects your entire life. So let's, I, I, I love that reflection, and it, it, I think it gives a good segue to, to go back to uh, the person that you mentioned. It's not a specific person, but the archetype that you mentioned of you know the person that's working really hard. Uh, they have a plan in mind. There's things that they want to do. They want that uh, next step in their career. They want to uh, ad- like address the, 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 the things that in their purpose, but they don't feel like they're being listened to or taken seriously for those roles and for that responsibility. Just, just I'm curious about the, the, the thoughts that uh, you have for people, maybe lower rungs of leadership that are trying to be more listened to and, and, and be more of that seat at the table. Yeah. Yeah, I was that person too. You know, I started off in healthcare and I had all these ideas and I, no one really l- would listen. You know, oh, you're just an, a manager or an analyst or, you know, and they don't give you the respect that you deserve just by being a human with good ideas. And so you'll, you'll run into a lot of that. And some of it's natural. People only have a certain amount of time they have to spend with people and they're only going to spend, they're a director, they're only going to spend it with managers or the vice president, they're only going to spend it with directors. So how do you sort of differentiate yourself from the pack? And some of it does go back to vision. Again, I sort of had this vision like, gosh, I, I know I'm called and I know that I'm called to have impact. And so I need to look for opportunities where I can express myself. So, so there's different things that you can do. One is you volunteer for everything. So that's what I did. Um, people, even when I worked Domino's Pizza back, back in the day as a delivery driver, you know, the manager, sometimes there was some, a little bit of downtime and the manager would say, you know, who wants to clean the bathroom? Or, or they would say, they were more clever than that. They would say, I need a volunteer. No one would volunteer because they knew it was probably cleaning the bathrooms. I volunteered every time. I knew it was probably cleaning the bathrooms. I was like, that's okay. But because you, you know what happened when, when, those, uh, when that 10 pie order came. And so the higher the number of pizzas, uh, the more expensive and the better your commission. So you wanted the really big deals. When those big deals came through, like the 10 pie order or something like that, 
they're like marks. Um, and so it really works, and they notice that. So it's the same thing in the work in the other workplace. Volunteer for everything. Who wants to help on the United Way committee? No one wants to do it. I'll do it. Um, who wants to work? Uh, I smile because I have a really funny story about that one day, but probably not for right now. But I volunteered for everything. And so I got noticed. The CIO, this was at HCA, HCA, Columbia, HCA. And the CIO, she noticed. She noticed me for the first time when I was a volunteer. And so then I, things went well for me afterwards because they saw that I was willing to do anything because I believed in the company and what we're trying to do. Mm. So, so volunteer for everything. That, that's one thing. Another thing is uh, bring out your ideas and, and make sure you get an audience for them. So you have to realize now, when you take this step, and one reason people don't do it, one, they might be shy, and believe me, I'm shy as anyone. Um, the second thing is they're afraid of rejection, but you got to get over that fear. And, and the third thing is you have to be ready for a life where not everyone's going to like you. So I realized when I was stepping out and I had ideas, so the CIO would be, say something. This was like at University Hospitals, going back to where I first became CIO. I came there as a director, and there was a lot of directors. It was a big IT shop. So I was a director of probably like one of 30. And then there was vice presidents and then CIO. And so he talked one time about, oh, he was looking for ideas to do X, Y, and Z. And so I, I got with my team, and we came up with 10 ideas for X, Y, and Z. And I, and, I, and I emailed him, and I, he didn't really know who I was, and, and said, look, I, I've come up with my team with uh, 10 ideas. And, and I, he didn't expect that. No one else was doing that, but I did it. All right. So he gave me the audience. I don't think he ever did any of the 10, but he started to know who I was. So I was differentiating myself. Now, some of the other directors uh, noticed, and, and they would not be happy that I was – doing something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and I learned then, and I had the same experience in the Army as a platoon leader, I learned at that point that I can't be about making all my peers happy. Now, it's important, right? You have a harmonious workplace and things like that. But when you try to differentiate yourself, not everyone is going to like you, and you have to be fine with that. So you have to be comfortable that you're doing the right thing and that your heart is in the right place, that your motivation is in the right place. My motivation wasn't to be seen to, for the sake of being seen. My motivation was I've got great ideas. They're not being heard. I need to do things in order to get that attention. So I volunteered for everything. I came up with ideas and brought them forward, even if they weren't asked. Because I love that as a CIO or as a CEO – I want people to come up with ideas. In fact, that's the first message I gave my new company when I showed up on my company. We had an all hands meeting, and I and I told them verbally, and then we also have a lot of collaboration techniques, you know, on the back end. And I've told them a couple times now. I want to hear from you. My first ninety days is about listening, and then I told them you can text me. Here's my phone. You can call me. You, I gave them all the different ways to communicate with me. I want someone to show some moxie and say, "Hey, I know you don't know me, Ed." I've been in this company for X years. I've got three ideas I want you to hear. I want someone mm. to come up like that. I will notice that person. Even if the ideas aren't that great, I'll give them credit for having moxie uh, to do that because that takes leadership. That's leadership right there in action is someone who's willing to take risks. So that's another thing is you got to take risk. So I believed in what I was doing so much that I was willing to take risk. And so like one of the initiatives was around customer service. And, and it was mostly talk to in theory, but no one was really doing anything. So I took a risk and I, and I said, uh, CIO, if you're okay, I'd like to work with this other director who also had a passion for customer service. And we wanted to put together a customer service program. So he could have rejected me. He didn't. He gave us the green light. So she and I got together. We f- did this uh, customer service program for all the IT team. And the other, some of the other directors resented us for that, right? Resented, like I said. But it was taking risk and it worked. And then eventually, when it came time um, where they were doing something else with IT and actually outsourcing IT, I wasn't part of the decision. Uh, it was the CIO and a couple of other vice presidents at that time. They are outsourcing entire IT except for uh, like six people. And I was chosen as one of the six to stay. And I believe it was because of all those things I told you. I, I wasn't afraid. I showed no fear. I took risks. I volunteered. I, I, I had ideas. And so anyone can do that. Right, Everything I just told you, Chris, anyone can do. And you've heard me say this before. In fact, I have a book that has this title, but I'm an average person. I, I have achieved above average results only uh, because other people believed in me, you know, the, the mentors. Mm-hmm. And, 
And, um, but also doing the things I just told you that anyone can do. Have a plan, have a vision, take risks, you know, uh, volunteer. So, so there's nothing I'm telling you here is rocket science. Mm -hmm. yeah, average person could do it. And if you do these things, you will achieve above average results. Then a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of the point that you were making makes me think kind of on the other side. Uh, there are a lot of people with great ideas and only some people are willing to listen to them. Like there, there's, there's one step of having to differentiate yourself, but there's the other step of, I'm sure that there are people who are listening, maybe they want to climb up in their own roles, but who are they, like, where are they missing out? Where are they blocking off ideas from, from those that, that, that are achievers and, and, and have great things to contribute? So to, to, to the folks that are, like, to, to the listening side, like, like, what can leaders or people currently in these positions of power do better to hear from the voices of uh, folks who, who have great ideas and create an environment where they're more comfortable sharing these new ideas? Yeah, I'm, it's easy for me, I will admit it, because I was one of those, like one of my friends wrote a song, I know you and I are both really into music, called Give the Kid a Chance. And it was this, this song about some little kid, and there was no way they're gonna have any sort of success, someone gave them a chance and they made it. I feel like that little kid. You know, there's people that open the doors for me, so I'm already very sensitive and tuned to that side, that I will listen to anyone that comes, comes knocking. I've never turned down any stranger that wanted to spend time with me, unless it was just purely sales. Um, <laughs> but if someone reached out to me, uh, and it happens uh, many times every month, people reach out to me and I'll listen to them. So these are people not even that are in my company. These are just people that might have seen me on, on Twitter or LinkedIn. In fact, I've got a meeting like that set up today here <laughs> um, uh, after we speak. So, so if you're not already wired like that, you need to really think about being intentional this way and carving out part of your calendar to help out other people. So you never know that some of the best ideas you'll ever get are not going to come from your immediate team uh, unless you try something different. And, and I think you'll find that a lot of your ideas won't come from your immediate team if you do that. So I've learned so much from these other people that I've met that had reached out to me so that I might uh, help them. But in a good portion of those times, they actually help me with something. So be sure when people approach you, to be approachable is the first part of the answer that it took me a minute to get to, <laughs> but be, be approachable. Um, don't think that you're so high and mighty or important. You've got to remain humble. And that, that's where I guess where I was headed, you know, with give the kid a chance. I still see myself as that kid. So I'm willing to give any other kid a chance um, and create venues for that to happen carve out part of your calendar for that to happen and and really listen if if the only input you're getting is from people directly around you especially ones that you've hired you're in big trouble because you know the emperor's clothes type or no clothes mm -hmm. type of scenario can happen uh, you get into group think and and so that scares me so another practical thing that you can do I already mentioned it but be available so people do clever things if you still are in an office environment you could have lunch with Joe or lunch with Chris or Susan or whoever. So I'll, I'll give you real examples because I'm not giving you theory here, Chris. I actually do these things. So at the Cleveland Clinic, I did two things routinely. One was walk with Ed. So I knew that a lot of the clinicians started their day early. So at 6 a.m., I, and we had great places to walk at the Cleveland Clinic because because of the cold weather. The, we have a lot of hallways. So you could get 10,000 steps in, you know, mm quickly in the morning. And so I would say, hey, I'm going to start at this pavilion at 6 a.m. Let's go walk. And basically, I'd do, round, do rounds with the docs, but then they could chat with me. And I did that for the entire time that I was there. Uh, the other thing, I knew some preferred after hours. We had a restaurant associated with our campus, and it had a, a sort of like a bar type place where a lot of people would go after work and have a, a glass of wine or a beer. And so it was called... Um, wine Wednesdays. And so Wednesdays at 5.30 or 6, I would show up there and, and the, the clinicians, anyone could come, uh, but in this case, I was targeting clinicians and they could come and unwind and have a beer or have a glass of wine, just talk about digital, talk about tech, you know, how, what might we do new or different or better. And so you create these. So if people aren't going to come to you, you've got to go to them. So I did run with Ed. So um, you could run with me, and, and uh, we almost did that together. 
one time. And so I, I create that sort of venue. So, so that was a, that's another technique is, so it doesn't have to be running, but for mm-hmm. me, it was running. So I would get a lot of vendors that always wanted to meet with me. And I only had so much time in my calendar, right? That's the pushback you're going to hear from people. I, oh, my calendar so busy. And so I would tell vendors, I'd say, okay, meet me at 5 a.m., you know, at LA Fitness or whatever club it might be, and let's run, and then we'll talk. And I had several do that. Um, and so that was always kind of fun. And some of us are still running today. You know, I still have these, some of these relationships are 10, 15 years old. And we've, we've always just went out and did a 5K. And meanwhile, you know, we chat about whatever they wanted to chat about. So there's different programs that you can set up in addition to the just walking around. And so I would do that as well. I would walk around and to, you know, this is when we had physical facilities. It's a little different now. So, but there are techniques you can use in the virtual world as well. But I would walk to everyone's cube or office and just chit chat with them because you'd find out so much more information by going to their place than you would by having them come into a conference room or them coming to your office. And that was the final tip I would give. I always had office hours. You can do this in the virtual world and non-virtual. But in like where I was, where I served last, it was uh, Fridays from, from nine to 12, you could just pop in. And sure enough, people popped in. It was so cool. Uh, and I love chatting with people. And, and, then you, and then you as a leader have to make sure that you do everything you can to make it really chill and not nerve wracking for them, that they feel comfortable and, and just you know, feel comfortable to the point that they'll tell you stuff that you need to hear. So, so sometimes the most valuable things come from those type of conversations uh, as opposed from your direct reports. And I love direct reports. Team is really critical, but you need to all have outlets outside of the team to really be understanding what's going on, not just within your own team of teams, but also with your constituents, with your peers, with, your, with, with those that you serve in the organization. So uh, let's let's think about that. Give the kid a give the kid a chance. I wonder if we can use that in this yeah. video, by the way. But uh, overall, overall, um, so let's say that the leadership team has given the kid a chance, and uh, that person has uh, has gone on and, and they've acquired that that title and uh, the the power and position, everything like that. How then? And you're you're starting in a new role right now too. Like like what what's the path? To uh, like proving or, or g- giving those those folks the things the things to prove that they've made the right decision. Yeah, so it's all about outcomes. So when I in the example that I gave you from university hospitals, I developed a six month plan, and in that plan I had measurable outcomes. And and I told that to Mr. Zenti. I said, this is how we'll know I was successful because I wanted the permanent role. I didn't want him to give me six months and say, nice try, Mark, you're out. <laughs> So I was very intentional. I had a project plan, and every time I showed up, I had weekly meetings with them, not the mentoring meetings, but these were just the business-to-business meetings. And I I took that to them, and I showed them our progress every time. And I worked with my team to make sure we hit those milestones because otherwise we were all out, you know, uh, with my new team. So, So that's the important thing to do is don't just take advantage of the opportunity that's given to you, but prove it through measurable results because data is powerful, as you know. So... So that's what I would do. So I would, and I've done it now in my current role, right? I'm the new CEO. I've been in my role about 10 days and we have a 30, 60, 90 day plan. And I know what my benchmarks are in the next 30, 60, 90 days. And I also already know my three-year uh, plan or, or the top part of that plan. And so I will hold myself accountable to my team, to my board of directors uh, to make sure that we hit those so that they know I'm hitting the mark. I don't want to be giving an opportunity and squander it. So it helps keep you on track. So it's not a punitive thing. It's actually a very helpful tool to keep you on track. And, and, then, and then you can learn. And maybe you're so effective that whatever your six-month goal was or your, your goal, you, you've cut that time in half. And then you go back to those who entrusted you with this position and say, I'm ready for more. Give me some more. Excellent. Well, uh, that, you've outlined the path all the way from uh, like the initial conception of the vision to the different uh, steps that you have to take and the bold risk that you have to, uh, have to do to uh, climb some of the, the barriers that, that come in front of you. Yeah. I'm, I'm really thankful that, that you've shared that. And um, I'm curious for, for folks that want to hear more from Ed, there's a lot of content that you're putting out there. Where can they find you? Yeah, so probably the best place, Chris, is LinkedIn. You know, so I'll often use LinkedIn as that primary medium as well as Twitter. And so LinkedIn is just my name, Edward Marks, M-A-R-X. And then on Twitter, I, I love to dance. I'm not a good dancer, 
but I do love to dance. So my Twitter handle is Mark's Tango, like the dance tango. And those are probably the two main sort of social media avenues that I leverage. And yeah, you can Google if you want to look at books. The majority of my books are all the profits are given to, to cure cancer, whether it's at the Cleveland Clinic or Mayo Clinic. Um, so I'm not doing self-promotion. It's really uh, meant to further you know, our ability to digitally transform our organizations and our society. So um, that's how they can reach me. And I'm always happy to interact with people. And I'll put one more out there, uh, the Digital Voices podcast. I, I, I have a, uh, a lot of enjoyment listening to that and, and hearing you talk with, uh, it, it's just fun hearing you talk with leaders that you've worked with on certain projects yeah. and uh, being able to get that back into the fold. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and your your podcast and your series, uh, you know, what you put out, Chris, is is exceptional. You're, you're, you're one of those uh, renaissance people in my <laughs> life. You do a lot of different things that I know not everyone um, has exposure to, but you're a, a very creative and a very uh, loving type person. Ah, well, really, really appreciate that, uh, Ed. Thank you for spending the time with us. And also for the folks watching, listening, also want to uh, thank you for spending some time with us as well. Uh, if you want to follow up on more learnings from healthcare leaders uh, like Ed and others, uh, feel free to uh, check out more of what we have on uh, Hello Healthcare on YouTube or where, wherever you get in your podcast. Uh, with that, until we see you next time, hello. If you want more of the latest from healthcare's thought leaders, subscribe using the button below, or you can visit hellohealthcare.com to get updates directly in your email.